All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get a little classy. We're here with Sierra Bogus, an Olivier-nominated actress, no one not for just reinventing the role of Miss Christine Daae in Lord, Andrew Lloyd Webber, the Phantom of the Opera, but for Lloyd Webber himself saying, she's the best. The best Christine, certainly. And I bet he sounded just like that when he said it, too. Bogus portrayed the role in Broadway, West End, and the televised 25th anniversary concert productions of Phantom to millions, by the way. I saw it in the movie theater. Uh, she made her Broadway debut as Ariel in Disney's The Little Mermaid. A white mermaid? Get out! Uh, receiving Drama Desk and Drama League nominations, as well as Broadway.com Audience Award for Favorite Female Breakthrough Performance. Her additional Broadway credits include Masterclass with Tyne Daly. It Should Have Been You, The Phantom of the Opera, School of Rock. Off-Broadway credits include Love, and what I wore, uh, music in the air alongside Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, I'm doing uh, an LGBT cruise with her in August, by the way. Oh my God. Boom, boom. Uh, New York City Center's Encore series. Uh, in the West End, she appeared as Fontaine in Les Miserables. Turntable, turntable. They're getting rid of the turntable, that by the way. That makes me so sad. <sighs> uh, originally, the role of Kristen Daae in Phantom of the Opera Part Two, aka Love Never Dies, uh, critically acclaimed sequel to Phantom of the Opera, receiving an Olivier Award nomination for her performance, concert appearances, multiple co concert appearances. Uh, BBC Proms at Royal Albert Hall, Lincoln Center's American Songbook Series, The Lyrics of David Zeppo, The New York Pops at Carnegie Hall, Broadway by the Year at Town Hall, Guys and Dolls at Carnegie Hall, Name Dropping with Patrick Wilson, Megan Mullally, Nathan Lane, Secret Garden at Lincoln Center, which is coming back to Broadway, by the way. Please, God. Mm-hmm. I heard. Uh, mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> she also traveled uh, with her cellist sister, Summer. Uh, and what's the name of your other sister? Allegra? Allegra, yeah. yes. Hippie, hippie, yes, hippie. hippie parents. <laughs> um, all over U.S., uh, Japan, Australia, uh, with her concert show, Awakening, live at 54 Below, which is available on CD, by the way. Get it. Please welcome Sierra Bogus. Oh, my God. That was the best intro. <laughs> Thank you. Probably the loudest intro. <laughs> yes. And the most enthusiastic. Thank you for being so excited about my career. Oh, I, I am so excited. When <laughs> Peter said, I was like, no, get out. Shut up. And I was like, no, more. United we stand. Divided we fall. Let's make this interview the best of them all. Um, I keep thinking of you as a West End princess, right? Because wow. all these, like, Lloyd Webber and <laughs> Um But you raised in Denver, hippie parents. Yes. And you you were in Denver for like a really long time. You did the corral. Yes. You did figure skating, like for real figure yes, skating. Yes, for real, though. for real. That's what I wanted to do with my life. Being from Colorado, all I wanted to do was be a professional figure skater. And I'm sure you would have been amazing at that too, like at the Olympics. I mean, I mean that's what I weird. wanted. Yeah, it is weird because, and then when Little Mermaid happened and I found out that in order to swim, you had to be on the like Heelys. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I know how to do that ish because of skating. So you know about that your lower half of your body is gonna be doing one thing and then your upper half is making it look like it's so easy. You did make it look very easy. Thank you. Um, and I was like, how did she do that? I can't even do like a step ball change and say a line. Like, I literally can't even do that. I feel like you can. <laughs> um, but music literally has been part of, of your career. And you even played the flute. Yes. I had a scholarship even to college. I didn't have a talent scholarship for musical theater. For a degree in musical theater, I had a scholarship for flute. I know. What the heck? Hmm. I know. Hmm. Uh huh. And right now they're like, mm, what, what did we pay for? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we need more flautas. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I'm like, please, I would love to play flute again. So can we please do a show where I need to play a flute? Mm. Okay. Mm. Maybe in the new Secret Garden they'll have the actors yeah, that'll play be, that'll instruments be, like that. Exactly. That's very popular. You know, it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Um, but this foundation in music from such an early uh, start. You transition from genre to genre so well, such as like Phantom of the Opera. We know all those beautiful higher notes, but um, you know, like even singing Camelot. But then to Ariel, I mean, these mm -hmm. are totally different genres. Yes, and acting approach is different, musical approach, even where you place your tone, your head voice and your chest voice are so married. It's like let's hear the transition, and you can't because it's seamless. Thank you. Um, do you attribute that to such a hardcore musical training in instrument as well as your vocal in instrument? Um, I worked really, really hard on that, uh, when, especially was at, when I was in college, because um, I always grew up thinking and being told that as a woman in musical theater, you have both a belt voice and mm -hmm. a soprano voice. I'm a natural coloratura, so I was always singing high um, when I was singing as a high person, I'm from Colorado. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> it's I, legal <laughs> now. <laughs> but I was, I was, I always sang very high when I was um, a child. So once I got to 
once I got to high school, actually, that was the first time I ever took a private voice lesson. And I wanted to learn how to belt. And so he taught me how to belt. That was just really important to me. So that's that's what I really worked on, and especially in college for four years. Then I wanted to be able to do both things because it, as you know, it gives you more opportunity um, when you're when you go out into the world and you're auditioning. So I never want to take myself out of the running because I'm like, oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that or I can't sing like that. Well, and it's so dangerous to say it's like, okay, I want to learn how to belt because there's a lot of bad vocal teachers out there that will yes. teach you how to belt incorrectly, damage your voice, or even damage your mental approach. Training anymore, and you are you start um, self doubt starts coming yeah. in, and the thing you know I feel like that thing that no matter where you're at in your life, you're always like, I'm gonna get found out that I don't know what I'm doing. Because none of us know what we're doing because we're all these like little beings that came onto the planet and we're like, bah! you know, and it's like, suddenly we're like revered as this thing. And it's like, but wait, no, I really don't. Like, you know, I still feel like that kid at the stage door when I was in college that like stage door people in the West End, especially. And that's how I feel. So when people are doing that to me, I'm like, I'm uncomfortable. I'm like, hold on. I'm the same. Like, it's weird. So. But you bring this like energy and this innocence to all of your um, to all of your roles. Thank you. Which I think is why audiences respond to you so well, because it's not. Do you nail the part? Do you nail the notes? Yes. But you also have this unique energy that's very accessible, I think, and exciting. Thank you know, when we saw Ariel running around the stage and even coming uh, to a role like Christine Dye that's so heavy. Yes. Audiences come expecting something and that role is like, okay, we know we know what Christine is. Yeah. And they've done a movie. It has a lot of heaviness to it. Mm -hmm. And you bring this this lightness and this Thank you. Youthful energy thank you. to it. Uh, I th very intoxicating. Thanks. I th I approach things, especially when they're really difficult sings. I And I tell this when I teach master yeah. class too. The only way that you can sing a high note is if you know what you're singing about. So if I don't know the intention behind what I'm doing, then I'm not going to be able to do it. It, w it will just sound technical. And that can be really impressive. But I always say that's like anybody, especially musical theater, that you're really impressed by, like analyze why that is. And it's usually not not just because they're giving a technical performance, but it's like... It's the storytelling. It's the storytelling. And in a bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My one I line in the I first know. act. And in a bed. You're like, I can't wait for act two because yeah, my role will be bigger. Nope. Nope. <laughs> what was I? Uh, nothing ever will. Yeah. Yep, that was it's it. It's a good line. Yeah, it yeah. is great. Listen, the line's great. And you can break up with people like that. You'd be like, sure. no, I'm just singing my yeah. song. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to New York right after graduation, I can't even imagine, you know, being in your secure childhood place where you studied all your life. You performed in many, many different shows uh, while growing up, straight plays and musical theater. But then you take that and you go to New York right after graduation. Number one, that takes some guts. Mm. What were your, what was your first month in New York like? What were the biggest things that surprised you? The, the biggest thing that surprised me is my schedule was my own because I'm coming, actually getting a degree in musical theater is some of the hardest work I've ever done yeah. in my life. I think in order to graduate, you need for in it, as a regular student you need like something like 12 credits for musical theater you need like 25 credits yeah. it's insane so i was working all the time all the time in terms of school so once i came to new york i was like i i'm doing nothing i felt like and i remember calling my sister because she's two years older than me and she had graduated um, before me and I was like I just feel like I'm not doing anything she's like yeah that's what happens because also you don't have any money yeah. so you don't especially in New York I didn't want to leave the house so I was never leaving my apartment the only time that you do is like to maybe go get some food or something or just like see a friend so that was my biggest thing was I don't know what to do with myself here um, but I was auditioning all the time and it which is scary in itself too because auditions in New York are unlike anything else yes I think Though, I will say, the my musical theater program at, at Millican University in Decatur, Illinois, soybean capital of the world. I, uh, I performed at the Hoogland uh, Performing Arts Center. It's oh, in Decatur. It's in the Illinois. Kirk Kirkland. Oh, is it? What's it it's called? It's the Hoogland. It's like 10 miles Oh, it's out. like, yeah. oh, cool. But I've been to Decatur. Oh, my God. They have a good red lobster. Thanks for the cheese biscuits. Oh, come on now. Yeah, how Nobody's weird. been to Decatur. Oh, I was. Yes, you were. Mm. Um, so <laughs> There's a lot of cornfields. <laughs> there are, and yeah. soybeans. Yes. Like, that's what they're known for. And when the wind changes, the soy factory, it smells like, I can't even. It's well, and when you log into Grinder, like the closest person was like 60 miles away. I'm like, Absolutely. 
<laughs> I'm Decatur. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, so uh, in school, I was auditioning a lot because the program, you were auditioning for student projects. So I was, re- I mean, I was more ready then than I am now. Now if I get called to audition, I'm like, I forget how. Because you're just not in that fri- frame of mind anymore. So, yes, it was like, but I was also more excited than I was nervous, I remember. Like, I was, I, I was prepared. Um which was important to me before I moved to New York, I knew that it would be really, really difficult. So I got my equity card. So I wasn't one of the kids like waiting out in the cold and that may or may not be seen, like all that stuff. So I did as much as I possibly could to get myself ready. So to make it a little easier on myself. Well, and your first show, uh, Princesses, yes. it's funny because that cast has, has I mean, you guys yes. were like unknowns then. Yes. And now us. everybody has done something. Yes. I mean, that must have been a magical show. It was. It was. Um, so Princesses was this musical. Of course, <laughs> I'm graduating um, college. I've, I've never looked my age. So suddenly they're like, great, you can play. Um, go back to playing like you're in um, your like freshman year of high school. So I was like, cool. <laughs> um, so all of us, this is like a cast full of Lindsay Mendez was my first roommate ever. And she just won the Tony for um, Carousel for people who don't know. And um, um, who, oh, Patty Murin, who's playing um, in Frozen on Broadway, and Marissa Perry, who was the final Tracy Turnblad in Hairspray. I mean, the list is like mm-hmm. on and on. There's, it was incredible because, so that felt like home to me because I had just graduated. It took me about three weeks, and then I, I mean, that's like really lucky. I don't just say three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Give us a break, would you? <laughs> I can't. I just can't. <laughs> so it's like three weeks, and then I like land this show that's like all these girls that are just like me and you know it was really it was really amazing and that's and I met David Zippel um who was extraordinary to me and uh and also his apartment in New York at the time was like this penthouse on Central Park West that I was like oh my god I want to live here so that's like the first apartment I'm seeing thinking like yeah that's where I'll live and right. it's like that cost 20 million dollars yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't gonna make that in theater <laughs> so um it was it was an extraordinary show to be a part of, and it was supposed to come into Broadway. But I was so green; I didn't know anything about this stuff. But we had negotiated Broadway contracts and everything. We were, we were ready to come in, but it never, it never did for whatever reason. That kills me. Like you never know what's going to succeed. You never know what's actually going to come. And when you put all your hope on a show and it doesn't quite go, that plays with your psyche. Oh yes, and this was like pre this show was pre Legally Blonde the musical, and once Legally Blonde the musical came in, it was like princesses. And then to transitioning to going on the road with the touring production of Les Mis, you know, musical theater students are like, yes, I'm in Les Mis. And then, oh, well, you're doing how many shows on the road going from city to city? Yeah. That's a whole different kind of experience that you hadn't done before. It is. And I remember my agent at the time, not my agent currently, but the agent I was with didn't want me to go on the road with it. But I was like, I literally had just written my last check to Lindsay, actually, um, because she took care of all that. And um, my bank account was at zero. I'll never forget. And then I went in and did an audition that day for something else. And the casting director, Tara Rubin, who's I I credit the whole beginning of my career to, she was like, she's not right for this, but we have something like an immediate Cosette understudy replacement on the road. And so I, I went in. And that day booked it and my literally had zero dollars in my account. So I was like, number one, I have to go on this because I need a job. Second of all, it's my first production contract. And third, it's Les Mis. Yeah. And I like that's every musical theater oh, yeah. kid's dream. Plus, it's my dad's favorite show. So I'm like, I got to just get and take like pictures with my Canon um, <laughs> camera like uh, to send to my dad. Like, so it was extraordinary and because again I didn't know anything that's going on and I'm in the ensemble so it's not like shows on my shoulders I'm living my best life and you missed act one once I think yes I did yes, because did. I was auditioning for Phantom of the <laughs> Opera <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the first time you actually performed the role of, of Cosette yes I do very well actually and I would never do what I did now knowing what I know I surprised my parents with it so I was, uh, we were in Washington, D.C. Um, I found out that I was going to get to go on. It was like in the schedule. So my parents were coming to see me in Les Mis. They didn't know they were going to see me go on. Oh, my God. So I made it a surprise. Like that pressure enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now Sierra would never do that. But then it was like, this will be so exciting for them. So um, I remember I didn't tell them anything, but also 
I bought their tickets and that was a major thing for me because it was mm -hmm. like for the first time I'm on a production contract and I can afford to buy their tickets as like these people who have supported me my entire yeah. life. It meant like, I don't know, that was like a big monumental thing That's for huge. me. Yeah. Um, and I remember um, coming on for the first time as Cosette, like when the turn, when mm -hmm. it turns in my life. Yeah. Or yeah, no, yeah. This so strange, the feeling that my life's begun at last. And the light like coming on my face. And, and you knew where they were sitting. Since you were I knew where they were sitting, yeah. but I was also like, oh my gosh, I wonder, they must be so excited. But I was also just like so jazzed with all the energy. And yeah. you need that for like, does he know I'm alive? Yeah. <laughs> it's like running and like being so like innocent. But I, it was, that role for me too was like such a dream. And so getting to do that. And then my other favorite part of that night was walking out of the stage door and they were there and just like, their faces were swollen. Like they couldn't even deal with it. And so they found out I was going on when they walked into the lobby and it, and it says, said, at this performance, oh, the role yeah. of Cosette will be played yeah. by Sierra Bach. What an amazing yeah. experience to be able to share with your family uh, that did support you. And, yes. and even for yourself, it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Um, that kind of pressure, I, I know your callback for Phantom in Vegas, um, you, you had to audition with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes. Um, and Hal Prince. Yes, and Jillian Lynn. Right. Yes. I can't even imagine what those nerves must have been like. Did they just have you sing from the show? Yes. Remember, though, I was like 23, 24 years old. So you're just like, this is everything to me. Whereas, like, I don't know, as I've gotten older, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, that would be so nervous. Whereas then I'm like, yes, I get to sing this role that I... I don't know, there's something about Christine, even to this day, that I'm like, I'm still not done telling her story. There is something that I am just like, it is some cosmic connection with this character. I have no idea. Um, so I remember being really, really excited for that. I remember Hal sitting in, and and where the callback was, was on the Broadway, uh, was the Ambassador Theater where Chicago plays on Broadway. So that was my first time ever walking on a Broadway stage. Uh -huh. And I came out and I remember seeing the glare of Hal's glasses mm -hmm. on, Always his head, on his forehead, Always. which is iconic. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, I'm yeah. like, cool. And I remember after I, so I sang Think of Me. And then he goes, well, that's just swell. <laughs> and I remember being like, wow, someone yeah. still says swell. Like, that's so cool. Al Prince could say anything he wants. <laughs> yes, he can. And I was like, all right, cool. And wow. so I was like, thank you. And then he had me read that awful. <laughs> it's that scene that's like, that. it's like the one book scene, you know, where it's like, uh, because you had run into the sea to fetch my scarf, you know, it's like this, like, well, we got to see if she can do like these lines. And so I read that with with um, someone who was also auditioning for Raoul. And then they, that was it. And then they asked me to stay. And I read with about three or four different Raouls. So now I know what that was, yeah. that they were like, oh, this girl's, we She's want the this one. girl. Let's see who fits but then I was like, cool, I'm just staying. And like, they just keep being like, just having now this girl come stay and then these guys are like coming through and I'm reading with all of them. And that, once I left the audition, as I was in the cab heading to the airport, I got the call saying you booked yeah. it. So it was, I was booking these things like the day of, which is never happens anymore. It's just not a thing. And we talked about approaching the role of Christine. I remember when I saw you three times in Vegas uh, wh when you performed it. People like, are you going to, for the slot machines or the buffets? I'm like, no, I'm gonna see Phantom. Yes, you like, are. Like literally that's why I went to Vegas. Um, but you made Christine a strong character. You know, when we first, the Sarah Brightman, it was it was beautiful, but I always felt that Christine was not like the strongest character and there had to be that spark for somebody like the Phantom to be so interested in this in this singer. Yes. What was your acting approach when you're like, okay, I got the role. How, how did you set about making Christine different for yourself? Oh my God. I love it so much. <laughs> I could talk about Christine for like ever. Um, I think that I want to start teaching a class about ingenue stuff because mm -hmm. I think that that for some reason we have decided that ingenues are supposed to be like these ha -ha, like weak little like mm -hmm. things that are just like and pretty like objects of affection and that's kind of their thing and so they can be vapid but Christine is Th so strong yeah. she is stronger than any of those people you know she doesn't show her card like the phantom's like oh, i'm strong i'm gonna kill people and raul's like oh, i'm strong i'm gonna kill the phantom and she's like i'm gonna actually grow up like yeah. what we what her ver what her story she's on stage the entire father when mm -hmm. she was so young she lost her mother when she was even younger she's by herself and she is being 
manipulated by this man, this ghost, this what this thing who is who is telling her that he is her father. It is like it's so messed up. It is I wanted to Daddy use another issues. word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really messed up what he's doing and how he gets in. So at first, yes, she can appear like, I don't know what's going on, but she does she doesn't know what's going on. And She's having an awakening in every sense, a yeah. sexual awakening, yeah. like all she's never been touched like this before. And there is a connection musically that she has never had. And her voice, like the the metaphor of that her voice is coming out and like all of this stuff. But I, for me, it's like by the time we get to right before wishing, right, actually, the second manager scene when he is sending the letters and yeah. saying, Christine will do this. And when Raoul tell her own fiance is like you have to do this and the answer is you she realized that i found that i am alone i have nothing i have no one and every male figure in my life has let me down my fiance this teacher of mine and my father and that's when she goes to the grave and she sings wishing you were somehow here again that's why she does it because she's like you mother you know it's like mm -hmm. you have let me down because there is in grief there's also such anger yeah. and it's like i am this i'm young i have i don't know what's going on and i i am now in charge of keeping this opera house running and this like i am now this prima donna that i didn't ask for the prima donna carl that she hates me i have nothing and actually who i found found is her only friend is, is actually isn't meg because she's not strong and grounded enough it's madame giri she's actually the only one who's like looking out for christine but once i sing wishing it's like the story is it completely shifts for christine she's like i know who i am and i'm saying goodbye i'm saying goodbye to what i thought this was supposed to yeah. be and now i'm growing up now i'm a woman so we watch her become who she is so that she has the strength later um, to stand up to the phantom in the end. And the kiss is from deep love. I do love you. And this is the only language in which you can understand. I can't, I mean, Christine is extraordinary. She's extraordinary. And the way that she's written to sing, it's like a glove. It's like, I don't know. There is something that I that I just feel like such a spiritual connection to. And she is the character that we see the full arc. Yes. From the strength at the end. I mean, she's. But don't worry, that phantom gets that last bow. <laughs> I'm like, but you know what? Funny? It's like he, it's sure. like 20 minutes in. It's like okay. He's on stage for 20 minutes. Yeah. The entire the show's two and a half hours. He on stage 20 minutes. And you got to revisit the role in a very unique way. Uh, mm -hmm. When they announced Phantom of the Opera 2, which is, you know, the slang way of saying uh, love never dies, it was like, hmm? <laughs> um, workshopping, that must have been very interesting. Yes. Because you have brought this strength to Christine, and we see uh, Raoul still... I never understood why she went after Raoul. I'm like, oh, he's pretty, so Well, much. he makes sense. He makes sense on paper. Yes. And at the start, he's not doing anything wrong. He's actually really loving, and he's like... What's wrong? Like, I want to help you. I don't under... But he can't understand that connection that she has. He doesn't understand music. He doesn't under... There is... Yes. And we've all dated it. people like yes, that. Yes, we like, have. Where's the passion in you? Yes, sure. you're the nicest. Yes, everything... You look right. Are, he yeah. looks right. Yes, the whole thing. Whereas, try and explain the phantom, that I'm marrying the phantom to your parents. Yeah. Um, he has half a face. <laughs> he lives under the opera house. Um, he has a boat, and he has actually a doll that looks just like me. Creepy. And he's mil and murdered people. Yeah. But damn, he looks good in the tuxedo. But oh my god, we have this connection. <laughs> but that's but what happens yes. in real life. Yes, we get it does. inspired by sometimes the strangest yes. people in, yes. in our life. Yes. What was it like workshopping that? Because I know that the piece went through so many different transitions mm -hmm. and changes. How often were you guys changing? It? Well, the very first time that I flew there to do the workshop was only to workshop the second act of it. And it was while I was doing Little Mermaid, actually, at the time. And so I go there, and it was one week long. And that's when I sang the material for the first time and all that stuff. And I was I was in heaven because I'm like, oh, my God. By the time she sings the aria, Love Never Dies. Yeah. And it just put into play like everything that I had already felt about these characters. And 
I personally loved the piece, but I also loved who I was working with. I mean, those people in London are still my London family. Um, all the, the actors that I was working with, the director was Jack O'Brien, who's to me one of my favorite directors I've ever worked with. He's so smart. And he filled in all kinds of blanks that the audience are like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. But for us as the actors, it was like, it was heaven because I remember he wrote out like a dissertation for what Christine's going through the day that she arrived, which the audience doesn't see, but to help me know what was going on, the first moment you see Christine get off the boat after she's received this like random telegram and now she's off the boat and he's like, I remember him saying that's like back then in that time, the way that you arrive was via a boat from London all the way to New York, to Coney Island, what you see, what Coney Island was like during that time, what you would have been thinking about, how gray it was, like all these things that she would have been going through. And then suddenly you arrive. So he did all kinds of stuff like that. So for, uh, it went through a lot of change. The, the weird and strange and awful part of it was that once we had opened and we were running, then a whole new team came aboard and rehearsed their version of it. And so that's unheard of. I've never experienced anything like that. And I had a very hard time with that part of things because I'm doing the version that I was taught and that we worked so hard on and all this stuff. And now suddenly it's being completely changed around. And um, I only had like a couple months left in my contract at that point, but that's why. So now these new versions that we see, I don't even know what they are. Yeah, it's it's changed quite quite yes. a bit, and I still feel it hasn't quite found its footing. Yes, um, and maybe that's because the parents have changed, so to speak. In, I think so, in, in and running it, and I think it's also such a hard thing because the fans of Phantom, it's been, I mean, that was that was the Hamilton of its time. Yeah, so people think they own that story. So I don't think anyone's ever going to be satisfied with the version of it, and it's such a weird. Thing to carry on you kind of want to know what happens after but you kind of also want to fill in the blanks for yourself because how phantom ends is leaving you with the question mm -hmm. this is trying to answer the question but people have answered it for themselves already so it's very hard i think to get people behind this is the answer it's funny the first time i listened to the cast recording i was like okay uh which of the Phantom lyrics or lines are going to be in there? And I kept listening. I was like, it's very little music yes. from first. And it's funny because as a fan, it's a sequel. It should be something different. Yes. But, as but you still want. That's right. Yes. And I remember Andrew adding, um, right before I sing Love Never Die, after the Phantom comes and sings to her in her dressing room, the, se the reprise of Till I Hear You Sing. And then in her state, she sings, uh, da, 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 da. what's the lyric? Uh, uh, now I can't remember. It's from Second Manager's. Oh, Twisted Every Way. Yeah. Twisted Every Way, what answer can I give? And Andrew, that's the song that Andrew plays when he needs to even just like settle himself for what really? he's going to. It's one of the, I love that piece. That's like, it's such a small like motif, but that's where, where she is. And that lyric too, Twisted Every Way, mm -hmm. what answer can I give? And it's like, um, he kills without without a thought he murders all this i know i can't refuse and yet i wish i could that is what's going on in her head before she sings this aria i love this depth that you that you've brought to this character i thank you um and like i said it's evident in every role that you do um a show that you have coming up that you are not getting this huge rehearsal process. Um, we know the Hollywood Bowl every summer puts together all-star cast, uh, stars from screen, stage. Um, you're doing Into the Woods yes. um, at the Hollywood Bowl with probably the most unique pairing of actors, different genres, different resumes that I've ever seen. Yes. And you're kind of thrown into the process. It's rehearse, perform a few nights, and then it's like, Okay, that okay, was bye. Into the Woods, which yes. is not a small show. Mm -hmm. um, how, uh, y and of course you're playing Cinderella. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. <laughs> how, when you found out that you were doing it, it's a whole different kind of strength, but this kind of same elements that you have brought to Christine. It's like this strong woman that you know, Cinderella's always been like, my prince, and she's like, mm. Yeah. How have you approached this role differently than, let's say, Christine or even a Ariel? I guess I have to say that I sort of approach everything the same way. It's just the characters are different, but I always approach it from 
where I resonate with the heart of each character. And with Cinderella, I do love that she is, um, you know, she says this line in the first act that's wanting a ball is not wanting a prince. Yes. And I love that line so much because it's saying it's like, wanting to be married isn't actually wanting who you married. And you know, that we get so, as, as humans, we get so caught up in like, oh, this is what I want because everybody has this and this seems right and this will fix my situation is a lot of times what that is. And Cinderella, all of these fairy tale characters, why we love fairy tales are they're all metaphors for what's actually going on in our lives. Just because we're not like living in our, like some castle with a evil stepmother and then lose a shoe and like turn into But like we all a have our versions of an evil stepmother in our life. Yes, but what what I love about this show is that cin- that yes, you think you're seeing this like Cinderella mm-hmm. ha, who can talk to birds, which she can. <laughs> and I love that and I'm from Colorado and I'm always talking to birds. I love a little red like you can talk to birds. <laughs> yeah, she t- Yeah, girl, like, send it down. Anyway, yeah. yeah, she just moves on. She's she like totally does. She did, she didn't even like give it. She's she's not even like, yeah. She's just like, anyway, so yeah. about the Killing of the giant. Um, it's so awesome. But um, yeah, the the heart of her is that she's like, we watch her examine like what's actually going on. And we even see that marriage being confusing before it even gets to that point where it's like this prince is he looks like every he's charming and he he wants me. But the baker's wife's more interested in the prince than she is. And the, like. Because she know, needs that little fantasy. She does, and she's trying to see what happens. Well, because also she wants to she wants to save herself from her situation. And as we know, especially like in that time, we think, especially little girls are is this like a man will fix that, you know, but actually little boys are raised too, that's like the 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 girl will fix that. I don't have to grow up until the girl tells me to. You know, it's like that's Peter Pan. Yeah. Um, and with, with this, it's like the man will fix this for me. So she even says the lyric in the beginning of the second act, I'm gonna be a perfect wife. I'm going to see that he is so happy. That's her goal. Conversations about gender equality. Yes. We're having conversations about women in front of the camera, behind the camera, movers and shakers. And Sondheim did it with this piece. The women save everything in Act Two. They're like, okay, this is what we're going to do. That's right. You need to get some guts together. Yes. And it's literally the women showing us. Yes. This is what we're going to yeah, do. And I love that piece because it happened before it was even a popular theme. Absolutely. That's why it's like lyrically it's so smart. All of the themes in it, it's just like, but that's what I love about these shows now is that when we do them now, it's people are like, oh my God, like it resonates in such a different way with us. You get to sing my favorite song from the whole show. And of course, there's many favorite um, songs, but no one is alone. Oh my God. It's... It's an amazingly written song that stands on its own. Mm -hmm. It's sad. Mm -hmm. It's very, very sad. But it's almost a little hopeful as well. Yes. Tell me what that song means to you right now in your present career journey. First of all, I still haven't been able to sing it without crying. Yeah. It's so poignant. And I realized the other day, actually, when I was working on it, I'm like, for Cinderella, she's saying things to Little Red Riding Hood that were never said to yeah. her because she lost her mother and that's where she's coming from when, when, her, when the grave is the tree and it's she goes to her mother. That's why she goes into the woods because I need to talk to my mother who she's never been able to speak to but she talks through this tree, through these birds and then when that's gone and she, for her, yes, she's giving hope to this little girl but I realized the other day this is not something that she has known her whole life. So, it's the wisdom is coming out of her by accident almost you know it's like saying these saying these words it's she's healing herself while she's healing this little girl and um it's profound um and also i one of my favorite favorite lyrics in this in that piece is witches can be right yeah, giants can, can be, be good. good you decide what's right you decide what's good and that was like holy political climate i was gonna say like that's that's you decide what's happening. and that's the thing is that it's i mean and saying that no one is alone it's so tr- yes we come onto this planet alone we leave this planet yeah. alone but we aren't we are hardwired for human connection as Brene Brown says I love Brene Brown and I and that is what what this is we are we are there is 
an inextricable bond between us as humans and we're trying to understand each other and all these characters are coming together in the woods trying to understand From all each, walks of life all walks of, and each of them are dealing with their thing each of them has a neurosis or, th or whatever it is and everyone leaves the woods changed and the woods are a metaphor it's the simplest and how brilliant that's like we're do we're using fairy tales so yes you can come and think this like come on uh, we're gonna see a story about cinderella and you know, little red but we're we are we are seeing that and we're yeah. And I'm really interested to see how the audience at the Hollywood Bowl responds because the shows are usually very like fun and we know Into the Woods, it, there's a huge comedic part to that. Yes. And there's your favorite moments from the fairy tales or some surprises, yep. but it's a really heavy show. Oh, it is. It gets dark. It gets real, real dark. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think that everybody's going to feel differently and um, depending on where you're sitting too because I feel like you know you might start out like super relaxed like way way you, you have know. some wine you go to the you border are, with your yeah, friends yeah, you know you're like this <laughs> you is fun it, yeah. and you're like wait what happened <laughs> then you're like wait why am I crying yeah. is anyone else feeling these emotions but that's the best part of theater because you never know and you can't manufacture that you can't say okay now the audience is going to feel that way that's what I love about theater is every night it's a different surprise it's a different energy and you never know how an audience is, is, is going to react yes um, hollywoodbowl.com to, to get your tickets July 26th uh, through the 28th eight. yep um, small window of time for yep. such a big show so get your tickets um, enjoy the Hollywood Bowl and enjoy this this, this cast of characters have, have you met everybody I haven't before? met everyone I've worked with a couple people yeah. before but I'm so excited I mean once this cast came to be it's like I wish that we were doing a long run of this because it's like, oh my God, all these I wish people. There was a recording being made. I know, I know. Me Do too. Do it for charity, Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, come on. Yeah, please. Um, also, if you need an understudy and somebody needs to kiss Cheyenne Jackson, just let me know. Okay. Yeah. Just let me know. I've listened to the part. Good enough. to know. Yes. yes. All right. But as long as you've listened costume. to it. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> yeah, we can rehearse the kissing part with you if you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. You'll be good. Um, and you've got to perform in so many different cities, so many different countries. Uh, what a whirlwind your career has been. Hmm. I, I can't even imagine what's in the future. What what kind of role would you want to tackle next? I never, <laughs> I feel like I always answer this question with whatever role presents itself to me becomes the one that's like, oh, this is my dream. Um, straight, I'm working on Ever After right now, which yeah. is the movie from 1998 mm -hmm. or something. James Martin. And Drew Barrymore. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, she played Cinderella. After. Oh, and Angelica Houston. Yeah, and Angelica and they have Houston. that one scene. Yeah. I mean, I... Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. So that's been turned into a musical. And so it's cool because I've been working on that version of... It's a Cinderella oh, story as yeah. well. So getting to do this Cinderella, it's like there's something... I don't know. The universe is like, Tiara, can you do some Cinderella for yeah. us? So here she is. And what an amazing story. What an amazing song. Like I said, go to HollywoodBowl.com. Get your tickets. Uh, 26th for the 28th. Okay, we do a little rapid fire before we oh, let you go. Oh, God. All right. Uh, this is kind of a two-parter. Favorite part of Phantom, least favorite part of Phantom, like doing the show. Oh, favorite part of Phantom is, is music of the night because I just get to be there and experience that whole thing. I think the least favorite part is the quick changes. Yeah. I mean, the really quick, quick changes. Quick changes. Yeah. Uh, if you could go back in time and originate any Broadway role, male or female, which one would it be? Javert and Les Mis. Oh. That wasn't even a heartbeat. No. There's some pretty good lyrics. <laughs> Absolutely. And some good <laughs> phrasing. Russell Crowe, what happened? <laughs> uh, a show tune you would be okay with putting to bed. Like, okay, we've heard that enough. Oh. That's tough. Mine is Corner of the Sky from Pippin. Oh, that's fine. I mean, it's some like, of these, uh, I have to go with, like, some of these new ones even. I'm just, like... I can't, I'm afraid they to say. They were done before they started, I, yeah. th Thank you, you there it is. Say, and scene, and thank scene. you. There we okay. Go. okay, we know you're out there, okay. <laughs> uh, after show ritual, so you've finished uh, a performance. What is it that when you step through your door, whether you're in a hotel, what is it that you do for yourself? If I'm at home, it's I I hang out with my cats. <laughs> it's like the most grounding you thing. Have like two... I have two cats. Their yeah. names are Celie and Olivia from Color Purple. Yeah. My sister has Nettie, so we got all oh, that covered. That. I'm not, and Nettie's like the pretty one too. <laughs> like she's all calico, and Celie's like gray, you know, and a little like yeah. weird. Um, <laughs> No, it's all good. Um, so that really is my thing. I'm not like somebody who's like, oh, I got to have a glass of wine or anything like yes. that. But I am, I just need to like, I need to be in my space. I very, especially after a big role, I just need to come home and chill out. Yeah. Okay.
okay, I, I get that. Craziest fan experience. Oh, crazy? I don't. I think it, all of them. If whenever I come out the stage door, it's my. It's hard. We always call it the third act because you've just done two acts of massive work, and then you have to come out, and it's. The, it's always for me is the crazy thing is the energy coming yeah. at me and it's just it's a it's a lot but I You're exhausted. yes but I have tried to analyze this of like what do they what do they need because and what I realize is they need to be heard and they need to be seen so I just try and let them say and be present with what they what they need to do and just try and like allow that space for them um and then and then that's that's that so then and then i really need to go see my cats and that's tough because you are exhausted but all it takes is one for you to just be like too tired to like sign one more autograph totally and the fans are like oh this, this is who she really is sure stage. it's like no no like do i go to your job and yeah be like, you no know? i've realized that it's like because this isn't something you prepare for yeah. or you know in school you're not ready for this and you're not ready for any level of like fame that you get it happened it does that part feels over overnight the getting there is not right. but the fame part seems like it's overnight and suddenly it's like you're getting stopped in the street that I'm still not ready for and it is like it's very unsettling for me but I really am trying to just be it's not that I'm I, it's not being annoyed with it it's being uncomfortable with like I don't know what to do with this so I'm trying to just be as like grounded as possible and just allow them to have their experience. And what a great role model you are talking about the strength that you bring to ingenue roles or, or any uh, role th that you get. My first time meeting Patti Lapone, she invited me backstage because I had written her so many letters. Then I brought five things for her to sign and she was like, mm, no boo boo. Yeah, she, she liked like, too okay, much. Done. Uh -huh. like, but I love you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the funniest or craziest on stage mishap. Oh, that would be in Phantom in Wishing with the iconic like phew, cape yeah, yeah. going like this, and I fling it out during Wishing, and it as my arms are out, then the cape starts wrapping around me like this, and I have to take these steps forward, and I step upon the cape, and I go all the way down, and so now I'm on the ground, and I'm like, well, I'm about to Maria Callas this, and I'm like clawing, like mm -hmm. try to forgive, like it turned oh, into the most that, dramatic, <laughs> like oh my God, what is this choice this girl is making That's right be now? Every future production. Yeah. Yeah, they're like, Sierra Boggess yeah. went down to her knees here, you guys. She belly crawled. I love that so much. Uh, tell our viewers and listeners where, where they can find you on social media. Oh, you can find me. My website, sierrabogus.com. Uh, my two G's, two S's. Two G's, two S's. Um, my Twitter is, I think, Sierra Bogus. My Instagram is official Sierra Bogus. I had to put the stupid official because yeah. someone was pretending they were me, mm -hmm. and so I had to do it. Um, and it's on Sarah Facebook, Brightman. I know it's her. It was, you know, it was. <laughs> <laughs> you <betcha. laughs> Um, I love it. I, we literally could talk for hours and hours yes. and hours. Can't wait to see you at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, like I said, July 26th or 28th. Big thank you uh, to Sierra for coming in. All of our guests for tonight. Uh, my guest co-host, Kurt, our engineer, Mama Rose in the chat room, here TV, and you, our loyal listeners. Share us, tweet us, DM us, uh, at On The Rocks On Air, Facebook, On The Rocks Radio Show, on the show.com for everything you ever wanted. Coming up, we have Will and Grace after Brian Jordan Alvarez. We have eight-time Academy Award nominee makeup artist, uh, V. Neal is here. She did Hunger Games, Mrs. Doubtfire, Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, Pirates of the Caribbean. We also have America's Got Talent, Michael Paul, and we have Star Trek's Legacy Keeper, Rod Runberry, and more. On The Rocks is the place to be every single week. See you next Tuesday. This has been On The Rocks with Alexander, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Universal Broadcasting Network. Find me on Facebook on On The Rocks Radio Show. Tweet me or Instagram me at On The Rocks On Air. See you next Tuesday.